pass that down the aisle and remember what Lee talked about, that we have our prayer request cards. And if you've already filled that out, please go ahead and drop that in and we'll add it to the stack. And if you haven't, uh, take the one home that you found in your bulletin and fill that out and, and bring it. Uh, also, if you're an electronic person, yeah, you can send it to Adrian McGriff and, and she and other uh, sports staff there in the office will, will fill these out for you. So just send in emails. And I encourage you uh, to, to talk with people in your office, in your neighborhood, and just say, hey, we've got a prayer service. Is there anything I can do? Uh, is there anything we can offer up? And I encourage us to fill these out and encourage others as well. And to me, there's something very powerful about coming up here, if you've never been here, and knowing that there are hundreds of people that are praying over your prayer requests and lifting it for the Father. If it's important to you, it should be important to our Heavenly Father as, as we lift these up. I encourage you to do that. But, and I also encourage small groups. You guys um, all decide to come up here at a time, and there, there's something that's magical about doing it in, as community. So I encourage you to get together with some friends, maybe go out to eat, and then come up here. There'll be child care provided. Wonderful opportunity. If you want to come during your lunch hour on Friday, that's an option as well. Uh, there is a lot going on this week. We've got our trunk or treat that's happening on Wednesday night. Um, and it's not just for uh, children. It's not just for parents with kids. Retired folks, show up. Uh, you can fit a lot of candy into a Crown Victoria trunk. So come and, and join us. We want you to be a part of what's happening. Also, uh, Jobs for Life has been a, a huge success. And we have a... a a class is getting ready to graduate, so, so kudos to them. And we have a couple of our students here with us this morning. We're glad that you're here and a part of us. A lot of good stuff happening. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. As you're turning there, I want to share a story about a priest and spiritual writer named Henry Nowen, who was serving as a chaplain aboard a Holland American cruise ship. And he stood one day on the bridge of a, of a Dutch ship that was slowly making its way into the port of Rotterdam. And it was early in the morning, and, and now when shared that the fog was so thick that the steersman couldn't even see the bow of the ship, which put them in a very dangerous situation. And the captain was there and was carefully listening to the radar station operator who was explaining the position of the ship in relation to other ships around him. And he was nervously walking back and forth across the bridge. And in the process of his nervous pacing, the captain collided with the chaplain and consumed with the anxiety of, about the, the danger and the perils of the fog, the captain cursed Nowen and told him, stay out of the way. Well, Nowen lamented his position specifically and that of the church in general of relegated importance. And this is what he wrote. There was a time not too long ago, see if, if this resonates with you, when we felt like captains running our own ships with a great sense of power and self-confidence. Now we're standing in the way. That's our lonely position. We're powerless on the side. Not taken very serious, seriously when the weather is fine. I think Christians kind of resonate with this. And they, they wonder if the church is important. And, and they wonder if the church is important because if the church is not important, we don't know if we're important. And so the story resonated with me because a, a lot of times people in the church feel like what we're doing is re redundant and useless. And there was a time when, when the church house was positioned in the center of town. I, I grew up watching westerns w with my father. And, and right there in the western town, right at the end of the street, you'd see the church. And all within the conversations of things happening on, there was the, the clergyman that would weigh in on what's happening. And it appears now that the church house is no longer placed at the center of town and the clergy at the center of debate. Oh, folks, call us up from time to time when, when there's a need for us to marry or bury one of their family members. Because those ceremonies seem like, well, they're just vaguely more, more fitting if there's religious air about them. But outside of that, they really have no use for us or the church. In his book, A Peculiar People, Rodney Clapp 
calls this sentimental capitulation. Likening the church to a run-down family homestead where you come back there and you, you, you see the dwelling and it's uninhabitable. And it doesn't have much, much value, but you, you hate to sell it or, or to tear it down because that's where you grew up. Clap states in a postmodern, democratic, and capitalistic world, me and the church feel they have nothing distinctive to offer or to be. We're just kind of along for the ride, asked to endorse the goings-on of the dominant culture around us. So we're just along for the ride. And we, we just hope to survive for the next generation and somehow remain in the game. And, and, and so there, there's a feeling that if we are going to r- remain in the game, we've got to heed the call of the world. Don't rock the boat. Stay out of the way. Go along to get along. Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong seems to find with this arrangement. And he believes that that the only genuine way to interact with the emerging world that we're a part of is to concede our moral footing, to take a step back from what we've taught all these years, and to become more fuzzy and accommodating in our positions. Here's what he said. If it means keeping your spot at the table, you willingly admit that you have no real message. The ends justify the means in order to keep the church house open. Is that what we believe? We take a step back from the culture around us and and kind of be this uh, accommodating group group of folks and just kind of, well, whatever, as long as we can somehow maintain our place at the table. The power and relevance come through accommodation. Well, there's another path forward that a lot are are champion, and, and that's going beyond relinquishment of our moral influence in society and that new way of thinking is the entrenchment. And un- unlike those that resign to filling ceremonial roles w- w- within culture, there's a new group of, of people that say, we've got to hop off the ship. We've got to abandon for our own sake, swim to shore, and start digging in. Maintaining our positions and maintaining our posture within the world around us. And we see our mission as being zealots in opposition to the goings-on that we see. Those in the trenches do everything they can to undermine the ways of the world. After all, the world is the enemy. There's a group out of California that's called Citizens for Excellence in Education. And and they're dedicated to restoring prayer within the classroom. And they're also uh, trying their, their best to restore the story of creation within the science offerings. And that the group works to elect Christian candidates to office and and to throw out those who refuse to acknowledge the Christian principles on which this nation was founded. Here's how they describe their calling. We see ourselves as the police department for the kingdom of God on earth. We are ready to impose God's vengeance upon those who abandon God's laws for justice. Wow. And they're, they're not alone. Pastor and Christian broadcaster D. James Kennedy framed the argument in this way. We're in a battle for the soul of this nation. A battle being waged by two armies, the secular humanist and the Christian contingent that founded this nation upon whose morality all of the laws originally were founded. Our responsibility in the church is to insist that the laws of this Christian nation be consistent with God's word. So warfare with secular humanists is our calling as God's people. Is that the mission of the church? I'm I'm, I'm all for prayer and I'm all for creation, but there has to be more than being kingdom people than getting out the vote and defending the benediction before the Friday night kickoff. There has to be something more. There has to be another option between joining sympathizers and joining the cause of the subversives. Let's see if Jesus has anything for us in Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 17. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. That They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity. 
and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention as to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Wow. There's a lot going on here. You, you have the Pharisees that are linking arms with the Herodians, okay? And you got to understand this in, in terms of, of what's going on in Washington. There, there are times when you have left-leaning liberals that join up forces with right-leaning conservatives to defeat a piece of legislation. Well, why do they do that? Well, one group feels like that it goes too far. And the other group says, no, it doesn't go far enough. And so they become allies to defeat the bill because for very different reasons, they have a common purpose to undermine what's happening. So you have the Pharisees, and they're ardent nationalists, and they hate the Roman occupation, and they, uh, which makes them very popular among the people. And every shekel that they had to dole out in taxes was a reminder that we are not a people free to do as we see fit. We're under the, our, their occupation. Israel has got to realize this is God's holy land. Drive out the Romans. Let's restore Israel as God had promised. The Herodians were despised by the people. They were the Roman sympathizers. These were the royalists who curried favor with Rome by compromising their faith and aligning themselves with the house of Herod, which the people didn't like either. And so their power and their purse increased if they could maintain peace among the people of Palestine. So they're working in opposition to their own brothers and sisters because they want benefits that come from aligning themselves to the people in power, maintaining the status quo. It, but in a sense, Jesus was a threat to both of them. He was a threat to the Pharisees because of their popularity. He was a threat to the Herodians because he could, just, he could get the people riled up and peace would be at stake. So these strange bedfellows come at Jesus with a one-two punch and they ask him this very loaded question. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Quite a quandary. Because if he says no, then the Herodians are there and been brought in this to jump on him and to turn him over to Rome and he could be executed as a seditionist or a traitor. But on the other hand, he clearly can't say no, but on the other hand, if he says yes, the Pharisees have, have sent their disciples and their interns there to report back what he says. Because if he says yes, they can label him as an outsider, someone that's a sellout there to approve a Roman taxation would set Jesus against the militant nationalism of the people. AD 6, they had their version of the Boston Tea Party in which they're revolting against unfair taxation. And to suggest that, that Jesus is saying, you've got to give money to Rome, they put him at odds, and that would have been the end of his movement and his popularity. So that's what's happening here. So checkmate They've got him from both sides, pinned in, and there's nowhere for him to go. Perhaps this is what prompted Jesus, if you look back at the text. How does he address these two strange groups coming at him at one time? He addresses them as hypocrites. He knew there had to be a devious intent as to why they're, they're teaming up to confront him. But Jesus doesn't succumb to their plans or fall into their trap. Instead, what Jesus asks is for some change. I, I think it's interesting. I don't know if he was poor enough to where he didn't even have this, this simple uh, currency with him, but he asked for a coin. And they hand it over to him, and of course he's holding it up, and you can just imagine him. He says, whose image is on the coin? It's Caesar's. Then listen to his reply in Matthew 22 and verse 21. It's just brilliant. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Matthew tells us when the crowd heard this and those that had gathered in opposition against him, they were amazed and walked away at what he had shared with them. You know, if you think about his response, in, in one way it acknowledged to the Herodians that we do have oblig obligations to uphold to our worldly governments. And, and for the Pharisees, he acknowledges 
that we have obligations and things that we do as citizens of God's kingdom as well. So he affirms both groups, but he also challenges both groups with the statement. You know, by his statement, he's rejecting the zealots' revolutionary position against Rome. He's like, that's not my battle. But he also rejects the notion that we have to surprise compromise our faith in order to find favor with the men around us. And so it rings rings true for each one of us as well that we have responsibilities in this world. We have responsibilities to honor those that are in power. Scripture tells us that they're put in power by God. That's on the national level, the state level, and locally here in Huntsville. We have responsibilities to them. And it's not just to paying taxes. It was read earlier by our praise team in Romans 13. We submit to their authority. I, I know that this is hard. It, it is. Let's get it out there on the table. It's hard for us to submit to government officials and leaders that we don't approve of or agree with on both sides of the aisle. At night with our children, we follow Paul's admonition to Timothy to pray for our leaders. Why do you tell him to do it? Because God says it pleases him. You know, Jesus did not end with this, we'll just give to the emperor the things of their emperor. No, this concession is balanced with a complimentary command for us to go before our Father and give what our Father deserves, to give God the things that are his. You know, in, in those days, coins were made in a pretty interesting way. I think we, we have a picture of some of the coins. And it was, what they would do is they would get a, a thin piece of metal about like this, and what they would do is they'd have one person that would feed it into between two dies. And as soon as it was put between the two dies, you'd have another guy, you know, that was banging it with the hammer. And as he's coming back up, they would slide the strip, slide the strip until it got all the way to the end. And so then you've got this narrow strip with a bunch of coins. And you probably have a third person that's there with, I don't know, some type of large uh, cutting deal and, and would cut out each coin. So they're all a little bit different. But what was the end result is you had these coins that were mass-produced there in, in Rome. They're now being sent, not just around Rome, but all throughout the Roman Empire. These are being used for currency. So that's, that's what's happening. So you have the image of Caesar that's being sent all over the empire. Okay, so application for us is, well, we give to Caesar what's Caesar and the government in taxes, and we give God his money in tithes and offerings, right? Have have you heard something along those lines? The reality is so much more than that. If if only it were that easy. I, I know that our monies talk about in God we trust, and our currency has that on it. But this passage is not just talking about currency. Where is the image? Where is the image of God that's sent throughout the kingdom? We talked about this two weeks ago in the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1 and verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. You, Ethan, you are in the image of God. That's what you get for sitting on the front row. Okay? We bear the image of God. It's almost like we were minted from heaven, from on high, to reflect and, and, and to mirror our, our Heavenly Father above us. And so we become these coins that are sent out into this world as image bearers in the kingdom. It's pretty incredible. There was a saying among the rabbis of the, of the day that wherever any king's money is current, there that king is Lord. And that, that's where the Pharisees got off. They were thinking, it, it, it just shows that we're not free men because we've got these Roman coins that are here in our purse. Some refused even to do it, but they had to pay the tax. So at least, whenever the tax came due, they had to take this, this Roman currency and, and use it to pay this tax and infuriated them. They did not realize they were image bearers of their Heavenly Father first. Therefore, wherever they went as coins in the kingdom, they were showing where God's reign was. Where we are circulated, there our king is Lord. As a community of of believers, we've got to figure out a way to show people that we're involved in things in the community, involved in in worship and different things, 
our allegiance is with our Heavenly Father. How do we do this? Well, the first thing I want us to challenge us to do is by the things that we talk about. The things that we talk about. You know, Jesus here in other places in the gospel was asked to weigh in on some of the political hot potatoes of the day and some of the spiritual hot potatoes of the day as well. But he refuses to take sides. He doesn't want to jump in there. He chooses rather to bring up the mutual rights of the conquered people and the mutual rights of the conquering people. In a sense, by his answer, he's he's saying, I love both of you, and you both have a point. But Jesus could have used up his his time to express his desire at, at this moment for Israel to regain her independence, but he didn't. Why? I believe because he was much more concerned with the people gaining independence from Satan that had been tying them down, that had been holding them captive. That's the battle he was here to fight. He was not here to fight against Rome. He was not here to fight against Washington. He was here to fight against what's happening in the spiritual lives of the people. He's fighting against Satan. He's fighting against that control. He's more interested in the spiritual battle being waged of the day. I confess I easily get caught up in politics. But if if that's what I'm thinking about, that's the thing I'm going to be talking about. I guarantee God is much more concerned with the health of our hearts than the current state of our health care system in our country. What did people come on campus or or, or with us in the cafeteria or, or they're enjoying coffee with us at a diner? And they hear us talking about the things that are keeping us and the things that are holding us hostage and and how we can get through troubled waters instead of just talking about the tigers and the tide. There's nothing wrong with talking sports. I simply want us to be a different people, that we're consumed in our hearts and our minds and the things that we're talking about are about kingdom-related matters and what's happening and how can we help each other. Talking about the things that will last. For us to make the most of every opportunity, Scripture tells us the days are evil. May our conversations be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Talking about the things that that will preserve and save people. Secondly, we communicate our allegiance by the things that we long to happen. The things that we long to happen. Our hearts should long for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not for America to return to the glory days of the 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, depending on what decade you grew up in. I love my country. The scripture tells us that nations and leaders will rise and fall. I don't long for my children to experience the world that I grew up in. I desire for them to be united with their Savior for all of eternity. This world is not our home, folks. Why are we so consumed with it? Why is that all that we're sending out in our emails is, is about stuff about political leaders and what's happening? In the, yes, that's important. Yes, we need to be involved in the political process, but we've got to be engaged in kingdom business. That has to be what's on our hearts. That has to be what's on our lips. And that has to be what we long to happen. If, if you were to, to press me, I would say my two favorite chapters in, in all of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, after he gives the long list of all of those that remained faithful, and those that we read sometime in the Old Testament, go, well, they're listed? Yes, God used these people. And after listing all the who's who and all the people that remained faithful to him, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things that were promised in this life. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers in this world. Teens, we've we got to have some aliens and strangers on your campus. You guys are going to be walking to a different beat than the world around us. Young adults and older adults, we've got to show by, by everything we're doing in our life that this world is not it. That we have not arrived and there's something more to what we're called to do. We're called to show that the allegiance belongs to the Heavenly Father. It's encouraging to me when you look at Simon the Zealot that once he encountered Jesus and saw what the kingdom was about, he drops his dagger and says, I'm going to be fighting for something more important. You have Matthew 
that sees the true riches of the kingdom and says, why don't I go back to the tax collector's booth to gain the riches of this world that mean nothing? They got a glimpse of what Jesus was offering and says, that's what I want. May we return to the foot of the cross and the teachings of Christ and say, this is what we truly want for our family. This is what we want for our church. This is what we want for our community. May we pursue these things. May we long for these things to happen. The final thing is by the things that we go after, the things that we pursue. We're not called to cast truth aside in order for us to endorse the world around us. We are done if we're unwilling to live like Jesus and call others to live like Jesus. We, we can't rob the power of the gospel by trying to be accommodating and to be liked. It has power there, and that power changes people's lives. If you pull that out, we have no voice. But we're also done as a congregation if we fail to love those and have a desire for them to come to know Jesus. If we see people as the enemy, if we see people that they've got to be locked out, and we've got to protect our family from these people, we're done. We, we have no voice. We may have the truth, but unless we love people, we're not going to share that truth with them. I pray this week that each of us will strive to have a spiritual conversation. That, that was a challenge I gave to our small group last Saturday night. And by the way, you've got one more week, folks, in our group. Have a spiritual conversation. Let it start with someone here on this campus, a fellow brother or sister. And don't just talk about work. Don't just talk about sports. Don't just talk about the goings-on with your kids. Have a spiritual conversation about the things that are most important and then take that out to others. I, I pray that we'll choose to do this. Share your passion for the Lord with someone you care about. Secondly, I, I, I'm going to call this church to pray for our community of believers, the folks that are gathered here, that we'd be more and more about the kingdom of God. I, I pray that we'll long for this for the world to come that will help us diminish our love for this world. You know, I, I pray that we will have a voice in this world. That's what I want. And to have a voice, you have to have a love for the people, but you also have to have a message. I want us to return back to that cruise ship as it was pulling into the harbor. After the ship's captain cursed at Henry Now on the bridge that morning, the dejected chaplain confessed he was ready to quit his job and hop off to the next port and just run away. But a few moments later, he heard the captain call out his name and invite him back to the bridge with this comment. Henry, why don't you stay around? This might be the time that I really need you. May we have a voice. and May that voice come from people knowing and hearing and experience the legions we hold only for our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Lord, may our thoughts, may our words, may our longings, may our pursuits reflect and display our allegiance we only hold for you. Lord, give us a passion for living according to your truth. And Lord, give us a passion and a heart for those that do not know you and therefore do not live according to your truth. May our hearts sing no other song than Jesus. Lord, we know that to fill our lives more with you, we're going to have to empty our lives of things of this world. Give us the courage to set them aside. Lord, may our allegiance be always with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.